It's time to get black, y'all. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to Robinson Ranch, where the sun shines low, the spirits hang high, and much to my surprise, after closing on the property, the crops have opinions that they will openly communicate, whether you ask them to or not. The vegetables here can talk, y'all. 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 But we'll come back to that. In the meantime, let's all sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the show. Uh, you're not done, bro, Craig. What the husk is wrong with you, man? I mean, you've been doing this for a minute. Like, a minute minute. Like, how many times do you have to remember to set up the segment, and then you come back from the segment, and then it's like you set up another segment? It's like pretty straightforward, dude. I mean, when is it gonna click? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I could be hosting the show. Enough! Yeah. Winston! That is enough! My bad, Craig. I just you just stopped what, Winston? What did you think? Uh, what were you thinking? Yeah. You think the people want to hear that? You're right, dude. I should have read the room. I'm just going to shut the husk up. I think that's for the best. OK, so I went back and forth on this one. But I've been working with my career coach on being fearless. So here we go. Never been done before. Three, two, one. Jeremy Peaches has a farm. And he is a bro. When I heard his story, I thought to, to have, have him, him on the show. With the horse horse here and the HBCU there. Here we go, there we go. He got a lot of goat goats. Jeremy Peaches has a farm. And he is a bro. Your attention, please. Meet Jeremy Peaches. Any space that's used, I'ma grow something, uh, no matter how small and how large. Sometimes I even take hands full of seeds and just throw them on the ground. I think that's always been my motto, you know? If I don't have it, build it. If I can't buy it, build it. You know, if it's broken, fix it. <laughs> my name's Jeremy Peaches, the founder of Fresh Life Organics. I'm the president of RST Bioscience, which is a sustainable agriculture company that does aquaponics and hydroponics. I work with kids, I start 4-H programs, you know, teach them about STEM and robotics and leadership. I'm a community advocate. I'm involved in a lot. Ooh, a day in the life for me is me waking up at, you know, sometimes five, six in the morning, hopping in the shower, lighting some sage just to get in the mindset of once I finish my, you know, professional life, I go to the farm. Sometimes I have to go harvest. Uh, and sometimes I have to wash and plant. So my day is just one of a kind. This is the life of a farmer. Big truck, big tractor, long roads. This is the life of a farmer. Whoa. Plant a seed, watch it grow. This is the life of a farmer. We on an attractor, we plant the rows. We feeding the cows, we eating the grass, we watering plants. Whoa. I'm always thinking about what's next. Big truck, big track, the long roads. Now this, this is our deep water culture system. This tank holds about three, four hundred gallons, and the water is recirculating throughout the tank. And inside of this filter is where we put our nutrients. From this tank, it goes into our deep water culture bed. Inside of the deep water culture bed, the water is being chilled and cooled by the ground floor. It also has different aerators inside of the water so it can be able to produce oxygen. Now, the type of plants that we grow in here are lettuces, leafy greens, and also herbs. So growing aquaponics or hydroponics using deep water culture is awesome. I mean, I built one of the largest aquaponics facilities in Houston doing this method. 
Sustainable agriculture, I think, is something that can move urban cities and urban farming forward. My vision is to create more of a local, centralized network for people in urban communities uh, growing sustainable, sort of a, like a network co op in base. This model is where you grow food sustainably, connected by a network of other farms that produce and, and work together and create research and does training programs, all these different things. And we feel like if the small, more family localized farmer work together, opportunities or for risk to come up um, is being limited because you have other farmers in the network supporting each other. the direction that you wanted to have in your for your life you know did you feel like you had that grounding i feel like i most definitely had grounding from my mother me not really knowing my father until i was you know 18 and i think that it affected my view on life so you know just normal black male story that you hear sometimes single mother no father by default because if you don't have like somebody to guide you along the way it's a piece of you missing so when I actually got an opportunity to meet my father and my family, I actually understood who I was. I feel like, yeah, now my hands are full, full of love and full of support, just a warm heart. <laughs> How do your peers describe you? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> How, How did, did we first, first meet? meet? I messaged you on Instagram, but you never messaged me back. You did? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> first young person I've met had their, their greenhouse in their backyard. He was uh, my only competition in town. I figured, you know, if me and he joined forces to kind of run things, at least for Houston. He's very headstrong. Um, whatever he wants to do, he's gonna see a way to get there. I was an awesome, intelligent, community-oriented young brother trying to do things uh, to uplift our community. They would say, man, it's just Jay. <laughs> it's just Jay. Why are you so passionate about 4-H and giving back to the community? Man, you know, stuff like this makes me wanna cry. As a kid, as a kid, I was always intuitive and you wanna want to learn more things. I think certain ages throughout my life, especially my teenage years, I went through certain things that average teenagers didn't go through in terms of just being involved in things that, you know, my mom didn't raise me to do or my family didn't raise me to do. You know, 4-H is one of the largest and oldest youth serving organizations in America. Being able to give back to the youth, um, like somebody gave to me, that is just extremely important and I want to continue to uphold that and respect that. To have someone like a brother in this game and, and someone who understands where you come from and where you're going, it's really invaluable. Him helping me scale up, I don't even think we could put a price tag on it. It's just like straight love. Like it just, it's like he wants to see me grow, I want to see him grow and when we grow together, it's just going to be beautiful. Right. We're not anybody unless we give back. To give them a hand up and not a hand out. If I'm growing food and I have equipment and tools and it's a younger farmer or that would like to get involved in agriculture, I don't mind giving them that information or allowing them to uh, come and work with me or come use some of the tools and resources or people that I have to help their situation out. We can't continue to do what we've done, stand in silos and not helping everybody out. Agriculture and farming and gardening is an industry to where people work together. And if we don't teach this next generation who's gonna lead the world for the next 20, 30 years, and we having these problems with climate change, food desert problems, if we don't solve these issues, we're not gonna to get to 2030 or 2050. We have to be able to use some of these, the brains and the tools that this younger generation have and apply it to models and solutions, not only for urban farmers, but for rural farmers. You know, agriculture, it is urban, it is black. <laughs>
I've dedicated my life to agriculture and urban agriculture. By 40, I want to employ all these technologies to build one of the largest sustainable farms in the world. <laughs> Ronnie, Bobby, uh, those are my friends, dude. Yeah, uh, it's messed up, Craig. What? If Jeremy Peaches can harvest from the fruits of his labor, why can't Craig? So y'all know how I am with names. So luckily, our next guest gave me a few tricks to remember his. Let's try this out. Okay, so, pencil, which is my favorite writing, utensil, which I use to trace stencils with my homie, Denzel. All right, I think I got it now. A CEO of a venture capital fund for the LBGTQ plus community, a father and a multitasker extraordinaire. I mean, dude has three computers to do three jobs at once. Need I say more? Your attention, please. Meet Denzel Porteous. Everything I've been through has affirmed why it's important for me to show up. If you learn something, you should share it. That's important to me. Knowledge is power. If something I've learned, I can share with someone else to help them get to the place where I am even faster, great. I was raised by a powerful mother um, who paved an amazing way for me. I thought, or I still think at times, that I couldn't raise a, a strong woman, a strong black woman. It all connects to Jayla, a daughter that I never thought I'd have. Biologically not mine, but every day that I look at her, she's, she's my kid. And she, oddly enough, looks like my mom, uh, which I think is just spectacular. I was born in 1980 in Jamaica with a single mother and my three older sisters. We didn't have lavish things, so there wasn't a lot of extra that I can remember. My mom decided to move the family to America for a better life. Once we came to America, it was like, well, the sky's the limit, so let's figure it out. It was an amazing thing. I was able to go to an elementary school where the variety of identities and cultures were exciting. We used to take trips with them all often. I never asked for anything, you know, because I always knew that my mom gave whatever she could give. And uh, this particular trip, I saw a necklace that I liked. She bought it for me, and she told me not to tell my sisters because she wanted me to have something special. When you sort of meet someone or step into a space or, or connect with something that just really hits your heart uh, in, in that warm, kind of amazing way, I think that's how I would describe her. They always say a mother always knows. Um, I'm pretty sure she knew that I was gay. And I don't even like labels, so I think even saying gay today is still a challenge, right? Because I could still probably fall in love with a woman, although my partner would probably kill me because I am in a, a committed relationship. When we moved to Queens, I had to find some way to make space and place for myself and fit in okay. Being able to code switch, navigate, chameleon, whatever it is, was something that I became very adept at doing. Um, but I think it's something that a lot of black folks uh, are adept at doing. I think it's. Not to say how I've survived, but how I've navigated. I remember someone saying, you sissy, why are you always with the girls? It's ridiculous, but it connected me to other folks who I knew had been called that word. And then everything changed. My mother was diagnosed with HIV AIDS in 1993, 1992. Here I was at the time 13 years old, it was around the time that I was trying to understand my sexual identity and grappling with all these things. My mother's gonna die, this is ridiculous, this is unfair. She passed away a year later. The fear or the dread of when she was gonna die was gone. It happened, it was done. And now you just figure out how to move on. After discovering my mother's journal, it wasn't until sometime later that I was able to start uh, 
processing it and thinking about what she was feeling during that time. I think it probably inspires me to do a lot of the things that I do today. She never stopped giving 100% of herself to us or to other people. And if I think about it, I guess that's part of the reason why I am the way that I am. I saw that she always had the ability to give more. My mom's death thrust me into living with an aunt and uncle who were in an upper middle class socioeconomic status. Being able to have access to the internet like all the time, it was, it was AOL and dial up, but still I had access to a computer. It made me want to start digging deeper. One of the things that I came across was an organization called Advocates for Youth. They helped me figure out who I was as a gay, bisexual, queer, non-whatever person. Understanding that exploration of self brought me to this wealth of resource and information that I realized was in this space of nonprofit work that then inspired me to continue to dig deeper into that and find ways to give back to the community. I ended up becoming an admissions officer, recruiting diversity students at some of the top elite colleges in the country. In the VC space, there are so few of me, and when I say me, I mean black folks. When you add the intersectional identity of LGBTQ who are receiving funding in the venture space is almost 1%. It makes sense to be able to change the way that people are looking at who is investing, and then to also just change those that they are investing in. I think everything is intertwined, and I think my, my life has always been traveling on sort of these two distinctly different paths. As a queer gay man and black man, you can be both. You can be all of those things, and, and people will have to just respect you for who you are. The CEO of a Pride Fund, the executive director of a LGBTQ organization, I didn't think that I was going to be on the board of the Human Rights Campaign. I didn't think that I was going to have my daughter. I didn't believe I'd be able to marry my partner. I finally said, lean into yourself, and all of these beautiful things have started to happen. Knowledge is power, and, and I don't have any reason to hold on to it. I want other people to, to feel and be just as powerful. You know, everything happens for a reason. My mother's death brought me to this place of, of connection and discovery and, and ability and opportunity that she ultimately wanted me to have anyway. Daddy. What are you doing now? Now there's a dude that has his priorities figured out. Denzel has really inspired me to double down on my own personal pet project, which I promise is gonna be a huge investment opportunity. Dial 1555 next Craig thing for details on funding cycles and my silicon dreams. I thought they were our silicon dreams. Who saith such things? Who's in my little intricately designed cabin, AKA productivity zone? Wait. My identical twin brother, Greg Robinson, is in the building? In the flesh, my brother. I've dreamed of this day. I've prayed for this day. Thought of all the ways we can take over the game, take over the world. Me too, Craig. But maybe we start small, like set up the next segment. You got it, handsome. In case you haven't noticed by this cameo of my identical twin brother, Greg, our final piece features two identical twins who are changing what the jewelry and fashion spaces look like, infusing spirituality, consciousness, and an overall awareness of a higher frequency. These two are changing the way we look and experience design. That's right, Craig. Their works can be seen adorning such icons as Eric Badu, Lauren Hill, and help me with this one, brother. Beyonce. That's what I call black power. Your attention, please. Meet, Meet Soul, Soul and Dynasty, Dynasty Ogun, Ogun and, and their, their brand, Le Chanteur.
Le Chanteur, it means transformer. It means the one who enchants inanimate objects. It's the one who brings things to life. I'm Dynasty Ogun. I'm Solo Goon. My name tells a story of infinity, past, present, and future. I was able to name myself and able to create who I wanted to be in this world. My name, it gives me strength, it gives me power, and it gives me a sense of confidence in who I am and where I'm going. Our sisterhood is a deep connection, so it allows us to work in synchronicity. bond as sisters, it really gives us strength and power. I'm a creator and alchemist and transformer. My work connects with time and history in a way where it makes me literally a time traveler. I'm able to tap into different eras and aspects of time. Just in aspects of time. experience of being a first generation born American. It gives a lot of connection to who we are in, in other spectrums of the world. We're able to bring an experience from a different part of the world as a black person in America. Using that experience to tap into imagination.
to heal ourselves. We're really just tapping into nature. We're using nature to, to tell stories, but to also highlight the connection that we all share within one another. And don't be coming back around here wanting to borrow my jewels no more. You hear? These are my jewels. These are my little jewels. Go and get. Ain't no brother of mine. <sighs> Sorry about that. Twin bro problems. Shouts out to Soul and Dynasty for not only killing the game, but being each other's muses and inspiration. As you just saw, it's not easy working with family, let alone your identical twin. Keep harnessing your greatness, y'all. And definitely keep the product coming to me, but just me, not Greg. Greg don't appreciate nothing, not even his own brother. That's all the time we have today, y'all. And as usual, don't forget to find what you love, share it with the world, and scream from the mountaintop. Your attention, please. What's up, y'all? Thanks for watching Your Attention, Please, hosted by yours truly. As always, make sure you like and subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories of black excellence. See you next time.